Good morning. My name is Jennifer Turner and I direct the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'd like to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson, Wilson Center's Polar Week and to today's joint Wilson Center Pew Charitable Trust webinar, China's role in saving the wild Southern Ocean, creating a network of marine protected areas. Now it's been really exciting for me to work with my, my Polar Institute colleagues and Pew's Protecting Antarctic Southern Ocean Program to design a series of meetings. Today is our very first one, and um, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. I also want to uh, express my thanks to the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute, Latin America, and Environmental Change and Security Program for co-sponsoring today's event as well. So let's begin. 2020 was supposed to be the year of nature, but because of the COVID pandemic, nearly all the international climate and biodiversity meetings were postponed to 2021. A remaining bright light for global action on environmental issues will happen in November, the meeting of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine and Living Resources, CAMLAR. It's a 26-member consensus body that, as its name implies, focused on protecting the Southern Ocean marine environment. And today, I'm very lucky to have uh, create, I've created two mini panels and of uh, five people. And today, they're going to discuss the imperative of protecting the unique Southern Ocean environments, and talk about China's role in shaping a path forward for Cam Camlar's marine protected areas. First, we have a stage setting duet with Nicole Bransom, a marine ecologist from Pew, and Ji Jiliang Chen, who is an environmental science and policy researcher at Green Innovation Hub, a Chinese-based NGO. And they're gonna introduce some of the barriers and opportunities for protecting the Southern Ocean and talk about the current status of Camler and marine protected areas. It's a part of the world that a lot of us don't know about and didn't know that this kind of action was happening. So they're going to say that, um, th they're gonna give us kind of the, the foundational background. And then I have a trio of speakers who are gonna dive deeply into China's role in saving the wild Southern Ocean. We'll start off with Dr. Bin Bin Li from Duke Kunshan University, who I was glad we were able to get her at this meeting. When I tried to set up calls, she was out tromping in the wilderness in Western China. Um, she's gonna talk about some of the drivers and trends of China's domestic land and marine protected areas, and how they may be shaping China's approach for MPAs internationally. Now the next two speakers are both international environmental marine law researchers and polar specialists. So second in line is going to be Dr. Guifang Shui from Jiao Tong University. She serves as the director to the university's Center for Polar and Deep Ocean Development. And Dr. Shui, very appropriately, is going to talk more deeply about what China's interests are in the Southern Ocean and offer insights to China's current stance on the three proposed marine protected areas. And closing us out today in the presentations, is Nanye Liao from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. I have a, awarded him the Involuntary Night Owl Award. It's 11 p.m. in Sydney, and he's still looking quite perky there for us. And so he's gonna, he's gonna go even broader, that he's gonna talk about the expansion of China's power on the global stage to set international norms that serve its own interests. And he'll discuss that, what this means for the future of Antarctic governance. All right, audience, you have the roadmap. And I'd like to encourage you to submit questions. Please include your name and affiliation if you can via the China Environment Forum Twitter, Facebook, and there's also an email address. So the webpage where you access this webinar, you'll see all that information down below. Um, Nicole, I'm going to pass the virtual floor on to you. And again, thank the audience. Could you unmute yourself, Nicole? Okay, better now? Okay, uh, thanks, Jennifer. It. Thanks, Jennifer, and thank you all for spending your morning or evening with us. Um, I'm excited to talk about MPAs in the Southern Ocean, but perhaps best, best to introduce this subject is Secretary John Kerry, who is a key figure in securing the designation of Antarctica's Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. Encircling the icy continent of Antarctica, 
as the most pristine of all marine habitats. The Great Southern Ocean. Looking down on this ocean, the sheer beauty and power of the natural world is overwhelming. This is our last ocean frontier. Over 9,000 species that can't be found anywhere else in the world call this place home. Even species that don't live here depend on it. Strong Antarctic currents carry deep sea nutrients to far away oceans, sustaining three quarters of the world's marine life. As remote as it is, the Southern Ocean is under increasing pressure. It's one of the fastest warming places on Earth. And there is a growing interest in commercial fishing in this area. The strain is becoming visible. We have the power to protect this ocean. It can be done, and in fact, it's already begun. In 2016, 24 countries and the European Union made history by creating the largest marine protected area on the planet in the Ross Sea. These countries are members of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELAR. Their visionary decision to protect the Ross Sea was praised around the globe. But CAMELAR also made an even more important promise, one that will have a bigger impact. They agreed to establish a network of large-scale marine protected areas throughout the Southern Ocean, including in the Weddell Sea, East Antarctica, and the Antarctic Peninsula. These protected areas would connect ecosystems, supporting marine animals that migrate between them as they forage and breed. And the benefits of these reserves will spread well beyond their boundaries. Our planet is changing. And never has this region been more fragile or important than it is today. Protecting the Ross Sea was only the beginning. It's time for Camelar to deliver on its word by working steadily toward a network of marine reserves that will safeguard the world's final ocean frontier before it's too late. Okay, well, taking a step back from the remarkable Southern Ocean, I wanna talk about marine protected areas or MPAs in general. So an MPA is an area of the ocean managed to conserve nature for the long term using restrictions on fishing and other activities. The science is clear that MPAs can produce positive ecological outcomes, including increased biodiversity and species densities. And by minimizing other threats, MPAs can build ecosystem resilience to climate change. In addition, protected areas can lead to economic growth through tourism. For example, last year, over 55,000 tourists visited Antarctica, the majority coming from the US and the second largest number coming from China. With a basic trip costing at least $11,000 per person, the Antarctic tourism industry grossed at least $600 million last season. MPAs are also powerful tools to support healthy fisheries. When an MPA protects a source of a fish population, spillover of larvae, eggs, and fish can increase fish abundance in areas open to fishing outside of the MPA. For this reason, MPAs can be seen as fish savings accounts. Noting the importance of MPAs for ocean health, global leaders have committed to protect 10% of the world's ocean by 2020 through the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD for short, IHE targets. 
These targets have prompted impressive progress on ocean protection with close to 7.5% of the global ocean protected as we near the 2020 deadline. And originally scheduled for 2020, the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to CBD is now planned for May 2021 in Kunming, China, where parties are expected to adopt a new post-2020 10-year global biodiversity framework. A large global coalition of countries are calling for targets under this new framework to include strict protection for 30% of the ocean by 2030, consistent with the best science. Other key international scientific groups have called for the establishment of MPAs, including heads of National Academy of Science of the G20 countries, the IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere, and the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity, which calls for the creation of MPAs to complement ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries management. Noting the value of MPAs, in 2011, CAMLAR members agreed by consensus to create a network of MPAs. This map shows existing and proposed Antarctic MPAs, including those managed by individual countries and their territorial waters north of 60 degrees south, and those areas south of 60 degrees set aside by the Antarctic Treaty as international high seas areas managed by CAMLAR. The two existing Kemlar MPAs are the South Orkney Islands Southern Shelf MPA, outlined in red here, which was designated in 2019, and the Ross Sea Region Marine Protected Area. In 2015, China was the second to last country to offer the necessary consensus support for the Ross Sea MPA, followed by designation in 2016 when Russia offered its support. The three MPA proposals currently under consideration are first, the East Antarctic, which is the oldest MPA, and it's proposed by the EU, France, and Australia. And this has actually received in principle support from Chinese President Xi Jinping during the November 2019 Beijing call on biodiversity conservation and climate change with French President Emmanuel Macron. A recent publication by a Chinese Kamler delegate reaffirms this commitment, but indicates a number of technical gaps that must be overcome for China to support this proposal. Next, for the What Else Sea proposal, which has been proposed by the EU, Germany, and Norway, China's objections are largely limited to criticism of the MPA's research and monitoring plan. Finally, the newest proposal for the Antarctic Peninsula region was first proposed in 2018 by Chile and Argentina following an extensive stakeholder engagement process. If designated together, these three new MPAs would cover nearly 4 million square kilometers and represent the largest act of environmental protection in history. The Kamler meeting this November is one of the last chances during what was once called the super year for the ocean to make tangible on the water progress for the ocean and get close to reaching the global target of 10% of the world's ocean and for MPAs by 2020 in advance of China's hosting the CBD COP in 2021. And that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Julian to hear about China's role in all of this. Thank you so much, Nicole. Those are stunning images. And uh, yeah, get, uh, Julian, you ready to do your clicking? And make sure that you unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm really glad to be here to fulfill my promise six years ago to Jennifer that I'm going to speak at the China Environmental Forum event. I, I wasn't going to mention it, but I thought that finally the promise fulfilled. Thank you. Yeah, here I am sitting in my home and pretending I'm on the bridge of the new Chinese icebreaker. Uh, so I, I'll give some background information about uh, China's participation in this uh, MPA ne negotiation pro process uh, in camera uh, to set up the, the stage. The first background I want to talk about is the is China's Antarctic activities. Uh, since China joined the Antarctic Treaty, China has uh, gradually uh, built up its capacity of Antarctic science and uh, logistics. Uh, with rapid growth of its economy since the beginning of this century, China has budget for the Antarctic, for the Antarctic has also increased. So new stations you see here on the 
graph there are uh, uh, four stations already being built or already built and the, the fifth station on the Ross Sea is being built now. Uh, we, uh, I see it as a natural result for from China, the rise of China as a global power. Joining, joining Kamala, the, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources is surprisingly late uh, because earlier there were uh, no interest in China to, uh, in fishing for krill. So, uh, talking about China's uh, fishing interest since the opening up and the reform, uh, China's distant water fishing developed uh, rapidly. Uh, from the graphic in the left, uh, you can see overall the overall catch of its fleet has been increasing, but the growth rate has stopped uh, growing. Growing, and uh, since the uh, 13th five-year plan, which covers from 2016 to 2020, China started to put control on its distant water fishing fleet, but the polar fishery fishery is still expected to grow. Uh, since there is a moratorium of fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean. The Southern Ocean is really seen as a fishery that uh, has the potential to grow. And uh, if you look at the, the this graph, uh, shows the uh, crow catch of the Chinese, uh, Chinese fishing fleet in Antarctica. You can see the catch is uh, fluctuating and uh, uh, the interest uh, of the companies were changing. Like in the beginning, the first two Shanghai companies who went, the first two companies from Shanghai that went to Antarctica to fishing, they, for krill, they quit. But there are also new companies investing, building new ships to go to Antarctica. So th these are seen as the uh, China's Antarctic muscles, the new iceberg breakers uh, the new fixed wing aircraft and the, the really down the left the right and is the new fishing uh, vessel launched launched last year and then now is the uh, first going going for his first uh, voyage to the Antarctica uh, about the fixing fixed wing uh, aircraft uh, I want to Tell, tell you an uh, interesting fact. This is this aircraft is actually built from a sh shell of a, a C forty seven aircraft that uh, uh, fought in the D Day landing. It carried the senior soldiers of the eighty eighty second Airborne Division that uh, carried those soldiers to and dropped them in France. The the of course the the. Machines have been changed, but the shell is still the 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 World War Two hero plane. Yeah, the ice icebreakers and the uh, plane, the planes are the the sign to, who work for the scientific expedition are more known to the public, but the fishing fishing effort is uh, rarely known by the public. Uh, China's, China participated, joined the Kamala mainly to uh, fish for krill, uh, and their participation has getting uh, uh, more. They are getting more and more uh, active in the in in the negotiation. In terms of the delegation size, the member, the number of the members of the Chinese delegation has been increasing, and the, the working paper they submit to the meeting has also. Uh, increased. Uh, China is quite uh, talking about the position on the MPAs at the Kamala uh, meetings. Uh, here I uh, did some summary of, about China's argument and the, the core position behind it. It, it is based on, uh, those are informations collected from the uh, China's interventions at the meetings and uh, the publications uh, in the, uh, in, published by the Chinese delegates. 
So I, I will summar, uh, summarize it to two, four point, points. First is the balance, balancing uh, the protection and the use. Uh, this is a, a, like a core value of Chinese uh, environmental policy. Uh, even, even the, the so-called uh, ecological civilization is a very human-centric uh, value that's uh, uh, embed, embedded with the idea of balancing protection and use. For the se uh, second, China, uh, I'll call it the precautionary approach towards precautionary approach, which means it's very, uh, uh, China, China has taken a very, uh, very careful about the scientific evidence uh, to build uh, MPAs. Uh, and China is criticizing some, some proposals are not ready because they do not have a sufficient design, scientific evidence. Mm. The third one is the, uh, about the uh, research and the monitoring plan. UK has just mentioned it. And the fourth one is uh, uh, the geopolitical concerns because China is not a, a territory claiming state in the Antarctica. So China is, have some concerns relating to that. Uh, but uh, looking forward, uh, there are new narratives uh, getting relevant to the Antarctic governance in China. Uh, those, those political slogans do not have specific meetings, but they do, of course, or promote uh, effective governance of the uh, global commons. With the polar uh, administration merged into the newly established uh, Ministry for, of uh, Natural Resources, more expertise could be brought into the camera work. Uh, with new icebreakers and to the new stations at the Ross Sea, more marine science and the related uh, uh, cooperation could happen. And uh, I think they will happen. Uh, the conference of parties of, uh, C of the CBD in Kunming ne uh, next year is an opportunity for China to demonstrate its leadership in biodiversity conservation. And uh, that would also give China a push to think hard about what China should do at, at Camelot. So these two meetings could, uh, was planned to ha take place at the same time, but now, now uh, the camera will happen first. And there's a new five-year plan coming up. We expect there will be further reform of the distant water fishery. So here's my, uh, Here's my quick input. Thank you. Thanks so much. Stage setting. Didn't dive totally deep yet, but we can do that more with the second panel. My trio, it's like we're a singing trio here. I'm going to start off with Bin Bin Li. So with a domestic focus about what's been happening within China on protecting nature and what this means for beyond. Thanks, Jennifer, for inviting me. So you can hear me fine, right? You, yeah. you sound great and beautiful okay. picture. Yeah, so this picture was taken in Antarctica, I think at the end of 2017. So we were having Dr. Roberts Callum talking about the possibility of announcing Ross Sea protected area during our semester. And then I got the chance to actually go to Antarctica. And actually the uh, South African swimmer, Louis Pugh was on the same cruise ship. And so I saw him swimming in the freezing water and trying to call for more uh, support and attention from the world about the MPA in Antarctica. Uh, however, I'm not going to dig deep into this because I will leave the floor for the other experts. However, if you want to know more about what the role China could play in this area, we probably want to know more what happens within China. So I'm going to talk more about marine conservation or general conservation in China. So uh, the cornerstone of biodiversity conservation is protected areas for sure. And if we look at the protected area expansion in China, the first protected area was established in 1956. 
However, there was a long silent period until 1993. So there were several policies and laws related to nature uh, protection, wildlife protection during that period. So then we have this quick expansion of protected area network within China. And until 20, uh, 2007 or 2008, we get into this plateau uh, period. So the expansion of nature reserve system, which is the majority of our protected area network come to this stable stage. So there are two levels of protected area in China, national ones and local ones. So the bigger ones and uh, the more important one absolutely is the National Nature Reserve. And if you can, uh, if you know a little bit about topology in China and the Western parts are some high elevation area area, of course, there are fewer people. So most of the high plateau areas in Tibetan are covered by nature reserves. But if you look at the coastal area or marine areas, actually they're not covered much. And if we look at how much of China is protected, actually it's about 18% right now. And as we know, the RG target for terrestrial area is about 17%. So compared to some other countries, actually China is not bad in the terrestrial protections, 18% and 15% of that actually is covered by the nature reserve system, and which is different from the national park system in the Western world. And uh, however, if we uh, look at marine protected areas, we'll talk a little bit more later, it's actually much less than the 18%. And the future of China's protected area, no matter it's terrestrial or marine, it will become uh, the national park system will be the core of the protected areas and supplemented by two other types. One is nature reserve system and the other we call nature parks. So these were three major types in the future. So right now there are 10 pilot sites of national parks happening in China and all these 10 parks are terrestrial national parks. And there's one in Hainan as I visited right, uh, recently and they were talking about proposing uh, a marine national park as part of the next steps. However, right now for the pilot sites, there's no uh, marine national parks. And for marine protected area compared to terrestrial protected areas, it happened relatively late in China. The first one actually covering marine ecosystem was established in 1963. However, until 1990 and the government officially launched the first batch, they call that the Marine National Nature Reserves. So five of them were created in 1990. And there was a quick development uh, only recently from 2012 to 2017. And the percentage of coverage increased from 1.2% to 4.1% in China. So right now uh, it's about like 270 marine reserves in China. And if we consider what kind of uh, marine reserves are there in China, there are three. The first one is still the nature reserve system. It's the majority and the most important one. And then there is a special marine reserves. And to put it in a simple way, the second one uh, will be similar to the IUCN uh, 2 to 6 category. However, the nature reserve system, the nature reserve MPA will be equivalent to the category one. So which is strictest. And as I visited Hainan and then there's ongoing community conservation areas talking and initiating in different areas. So they will constrain more for coastal area coastlines and mangroves. And as we have talked about um, most of the community or the population are actually in the coastal area in China, in the eastern parts. So these community conservation areas will play a big role, especially if they are the majority to monitor the process and carry out the monitoring and then carry out some enforcement uh, of their agreements. 
So it will be something interesting and I hope it could happen. So we play our role in helping them to set up monitoring programs in these communities. And besides uh, the protected areas and there's encouraging process relate to who can be the major player to manage these areas. Previously, government is the only one and doing the management. However, uh, right now in recent years, the government encourage uh, engagements of the public sectors. So there even is a 1% goal and proposed by the public and by the non-government organization networks is their goal to protect 1% of China's land and maybe ocean in the future. So the diversified management schemes will be very helpful for the effectiveness of these protected areas. And also besides the protected area network, there's more about the high level zonation practices and we call it strategic spatial planning. So apart from protected areas and there's very really important uh, policy people outside China may know or may not know is called red lines. So basically people use signs and to know which parts are very important in ecological functions and which parts are very vulnerable to potential degradation and which part are very sensitive to the changes in environmental conditions. And they use, for example, terrestrial and then they use like capital accounting and then ecosystem uh, services mapping and also endangered species mapping and to come up with the areas. And then they define three regions according to the three definitions. And then they draw the lines or actually delineate the areas they call the eco uh, ecological right lines. And these areas are for no development. So if you add them up, actually ecological right lines are more than the 18% we have already protected. And it's about 27% for terrestrial ecosystems. All right, if you look at marine right lines, and then the plan is to protect more than 30% for each of the provincial uh, coastal waters. And so which means the ocean under their jurisdiction. And then more than 35%, uh, at least for the coastal lines. And if you consider sandy beaches, and actually it's more than 80%. So actually this already put China, if we can make sure what happens and effective management uh, manage, and we actually get to the goal 30% by 2030, if we play this policy well. And then also mentioned by Julian is about the other high level uh, theory or ideology, for example, eco-civilization. And which actually I think is another way to express sustainability. However, uh, use a different word and try to differentiate and also add on more Chinese characters. And also this word has been used for the CBD as well. So which means we have to explain this well and communicate this well for people inside China and outside China. And under this, actually, there's a lot of different policies and actually even for some laws happening. And one important, I think, uh, policy is green is gold. And the loose translation, even looser than th this one, is the clear water green hills are the gold mountain and silver mountains, which means if we can protect our nature well, we have clear water and green mountains with trees and grasses, and this can bring us economic benefits. And it was surprising uh, for me to see this slogan, even in the far rural area and stick on the wall of this local residents. So actually if something is pushed by the central government and actually this slogan can go really, really far and really, really like local. And also there are some good things about how this can actually be implemented. So China has identified a lot of counties which they think have really important ecological importance, no matter for uh, ecosystem services or for the biodiversity conservation. And then they cancel GDP as the performance evaluation index for the government officials and also for this government. So they will use, for example, natural capital 
uh, and then they will assess what is the natural capital when you first get your tenure and then when you end your tenure. So if it is decreasing, it means you are not doing well during your governance. So which actually gives something that people can actually use instead of just calling green is gold. So how to actually make it happen is very important. So a lot of research has been going on and to see how we can make this index more replicable and can apply to more counties and cities. And also in 2019, the shared future idea actually applied to ocean and proposed by sea. So previously shared future is mainly mentioned, for example, for humankind. And then for the ocean is specifically proposed last year. So which can be a good sign to see how uh, we pay more attention to marine conservation. But as you can see, the marine conservation uh, was not part of the center issue in conservation long time ago. However, in the recent five years, I could say it become a hot topic. So for the public awareness, consumer behaviors, use less of the plastics, and also how uh, what kind of fish you should eat. And all these uh, public awareness activities and campaigns are happening in China. And one more thing to mention is China's role in international uh, arena and something we always uh, do research around is about and road initiative. And a lot of the times people were talking about this terrestrial uh, road, Silk Road. However, there's about like in the maritime uh, areas, so which a lot of ports and a lot of shipping and a lot of other kind of natural resources will happen. And also the race to the Arctic and it's already happening and very fast. So we're now concentrating in the South. However, I just want to bring this to the picture like the thing in the North uh, is also very heated debate right now. And uh, so the last part actually is capacity building. And just to talk a little bit more is when I first uh, came back to China and then Parker Foundation asked about, okay, who should we contact about this marine conservation? And people always come to uh, certain people and then people realize actually what are lack of uh, marine conservation talents and especially people. So then we partner with Parker Foundation, Paradise Foundation, and also Yintai Foundation established this Blue Pioneer program is to train the next generation of leadership in marine conservation in China. And a lot of them actually from non-private sectors, a lot of them are still students who are deciding which sector they should go. But one of the major issue we talk to them actually is the international marine conservation that China play a more important role recently and also in the future. So that's all I can share in these seven minutes. Hope I'm not over time too much. You did great. Thank you so much. And um, you'll close your PowerPoint and then Julia will come on. And, and I know that everyone's starting to gather questions in their heads. And um, as, as Julia's getting on, I had to, I couldn't help but think about how years ago when I first started at the Wilson Center, there was a lot of talk in China about green GDP. And I'm, I'm very intrigued that actually around new protected areas in China, that, that, they, that the fact that you need to have natural capital. This is it's, it's an exciting development. We have questions later on for you, Bing Bing. All right, Julia, the, the virtual floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And good morning and evening to everyone. It's such a great, great pleasure for sharing some of my views here, talking about China's IPA system. And I think it fits perfectly with previous speaker about the uh, continue on about ocean side of the conservation e effort in China. So I'm mainly mentioning about the challenges and the ongoing adjustment on the IPA system. This is actually part of a teamwork for a landfast ocean program. We, we've done our all the research and field trips to the sites, uh, roughly about 30 sites to different parts of uh, IPAs in China, like southern or, or the northern or the, the, the middle parts, uh, things like that. We are, we are busy in writing up or doing the analysis of the, uh, the raw data and also the uh, information gathered from those field trips and desktop research. So I'm just briefly mentioning about uh, the, um, the situation in China about the MPA. 
Actually, we know the coastal zone area for China has quite comparatively long, but compared with the terrestrial, it's not really substantial, but it's uh, significant in supporting of the uh, generation of national GDP. And also because of such a huge landmass, China has very rich uh, marine biodiversity and quite abundant and rich ecosystems. But probably we already know, like since 1970s, and because of the uh, economic development, so basically we have really uh, lost quite large amount of coastal wetlands and coral reefs. And we've seen that during our uh, field trips and to the specific sites, a lot of them, they are trying to get them back. We have seen the achievement over the past four decades, four or five decades, but we still see um, quite a pity kind of uh, heard a lot about the uh, situation. So as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, since 19, uh, 1980s, actually, China has been really uh, uh, experienced a uh, great uh, increase of various types of uh, IPAs. So we can see from the, uh, the growth of numbers in numbers and areas, and uh, particularly in 1980s, 1990s, and the earlier first 10 years of 21st century, but we are experiencing kind of major adjustment right now, start from uh, March 2018. So sort of a start, uh, stop there. If you look, look at the types of MPA, we have different, uh, we, we probably hear people talk about uh, the types differently. Like Marine Nature Reserve is a part of the nature reserve, including largely the, the terrestrial nature reserves. But we also have the marine part at national level, also provincial and the lower level. And the special MPAs to uh, kind of uh, compromise of the utilization, also conservation, and start from 2002, uh, quite recent. And then another type quite uh, with quite a long history is fisheries conservation zone. I started in 1950s actually, it's a permanent fishing closure zone to protect the, the the specific species for the economic value or the uh, genetic values. We also have a, another part called marine parks. They can go into the special MPAs, but they will be a different type in the adjustment, will be a main body. So I mentioned it separately as the uh, national park system. And when we look at the, the previous management situation, we have overlapping authorities several agencies doing different parts of the uh, protected areas. And then they also generate in the implementation, uh, implementation gaps. So this, this is the situation actually um, ongoing sin until uh, March 2018. But we are still uh, actually uh, facing difficulty. At top level, probably they already uh, uh, restructured the ministries, but if you look at the provincial, uh, provincial or lower level, they still have the similar situation there and not totally resolved up to nowadays. But we are still expecting there might be some major changes and then really incorporate all these agencies together, including like the previous state ocean administration and forestry and environmental uh, agency, all these agencies, they might um, emerge together. And then when we look all overall the situation in China, we have altogether 273 uh, different types of marine uh, MPAs. I think national level, we have marine nature reserves, 35, and the special MPA is 71. And the uh, uh, provincial level, we have, we have 41 marine nature reserve and 12 uh, special MPAs. And then the uh, municipality level and county level, we have 84. Marine Nature Reserves and 30. So altogether we have um, uh, 160 Marine Nature Reserves and 100, uh, 113 special uh, MPAs. And then 53 uh, fisheries conservation zones, so that's all at national level. So those are all the ones related to the ocean. And then we look at all of them. I think we have seen very, very strong feature of the decentralized designation because they, they mainly from the local level and they use the, the bottom-up kind of approach. And then when you look at the management situation, this kind of reduce the control from the central government. 
And then you will see the, 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 the fully protected MPAs are not so much. If you look at the number, it's quite huge, but often in, in implemented as de facto and multi-use area, particularly with the recent years with the um, emphasis of economic development, we see the re-designation uh, or the changes or adjustment of the MPA boundaries and also the changes of different parts of the MPAs. We see the touches or kind of conflicts between the utilization and the conservation. And so with the local at local level, and they emphasize more about the quantity uh, rather than the, uh, the the quality. So they, they are very, very uh, active or um, keen to design to uh, to design the uh, the MPA and to get the funding and the other uh, things to help them to, to do the conservation. But actually, it's um, and they, they, they basically more or less they suffer the lack of objective evaluation process. And some of them even they don't have the, uh, or they, they, they have very limited scientific information. So because they, they, they get very quick process, and uh, when it come to the actual management practice, they, they, they suffer from the lack of uh, scientific support. And the, if you look at the, uh, the management approach and the operation fund, operating fund is not limit, uh, not enough. And also the low level enforcement, we, we witnessed some of the, uh, um, during the closing season, we still see some fishermen or the native, the local villagers, they, they went up to the ocean and they pick up the, the sea urchins and other things there. And you can see the certainly uh, very obvious violation of the laws and also the, uh, the maintenance approach and it seems like that it's quite obvious during our field trip and also due to the, the uh, way with the interviews. And they look at the um, systematic kind of analysis. I think the, the whole system suffering from the relations between conservation development, as I mentioned, the economic development, and also the conflict between the agencies and consistency of the plans and other designs. And so eventually maybe, or more, 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 more often than not, it's the MPA adjustment than the, the other, like if we build a new uh, nuclear power station and they might change the design of the MPA size. Uh, things like that, and also the funding is, uh, funding issue between the national and the local uh, level. They heavily rely on the the the, the, the central government to to allocate the funding. Otherwise, they might suffer from the the, the low funding for for the conservation practice. And also uh, the conflicts between the property rights and the border issues. We we did see some very good MPAs, and they those ones they resolve the property issue. They purchase everything from the community and they, they can implement very strict laws. And the, the other, if they can't resolve that issue and they pay compensation fee and they still can't really implement laws and situations. So those are basically the, um, the, the I mean, from the designation and also the enforcement. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the inadequacy during the whole management system, we can see the institutional defects and the insufficient monitoring surveillance and also the poor legal awareness and compliance. At various level, you can see very clearly the situation uh, during the whole um, MPA management. So I think because of that, and also I think over the, the years and the government or the agency, they realized the situation. So they have really been trying to, uh, to uh, perfect the system. And then they had the uh, ministry restructure and policy adjustment focus quite a lot on the uh, on the uh, tra transition from the uh, uh, marine protected uh, protect areas, not only marine, also including terrestrial. And the uh, from the previous nature reserve to the nature reserve system, it's a bit awkward when you're saying something like that. But men, I think this new system is about the protecting system of the natural sites, much mentioning about the whole natural size rather than only a like kind of spot uh, kind of thing. And then under that system, there will be three types of um, protected areas, including national parks, very, uh, very top level, very substantial, probably very limited number, but will be like a demonstration site kind of icons kind of situation. 
and then the nature reserves and the uh, nature parks. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, confusing, but if you look at the, uh, the criteria, you can identify the differences. But the, still, they incorporate different types of uh, nature reserves or the nature parks into, into the, uh, the different systems there. And also the authority, as I mentioned pre previously, we have four or five agencies, even at the top level. Now they go all under one bureau, Administrative Bureau of National Parks, and also function as Administrative Bureau of National Forestry and Grassland and the Ministry of Natural Resources. So this agency is going, uh, kind of uh, doing these from scratch about the laws, policies, and also the, um, the uh, adjustment of the, the previous uh, MPAs or the protected areas. So we see they are drafting the law of PRC on the national parks and also doing the integration optimization of the nature reserve system. I think this is going to be done by the, uh, the end of or early uh, September this year. Probably toward the end of the year, we will see something uh, more um, affirmative and more clear about how the agency working towards the major uh, kind of adjustment. Also the assessment and adjustment of ecological red line. We had a red line previously for marine ecosystem, but now they are readjusting them and also trying to match the, uh, as our previous speakers, I'm not the immediate one mentioning about the 10 plus 20 and 30, 30 uh, uh, goals. I think they all, it, all that, that um, added that all those different types of uh, conservation effort together probably will make the, uh, the figure of the statistics better. And also a series of national actions uh, being implemented and the uh, establishment of nature reserve system with national parks at the main body. This is the, the, the guideline instruction gave a lot of detailed uh, instructions on how to incorporate the previous different type of uh, uh, protected areas, uh, special MPAs or the uh, marine parks, et cetera, all together. I think the question for us, for the team of thinking about, about the knowledge and resources to, to achieve the main goals. We've been working, we've seen China um, have been working for several decades and still facing so many problems. And can this, these, all these issues be uh, resolved just by, by changing the system? And we are not so sure about that. And also the existing laws and enforcement practice reflect the values of MPAs or the nature reserve system. So we can see the determination or commitment for China from at both domestic level, also international level. But I think there's still a long way to go. And also the changes to support that main ob objective. We, we still, um, partly for myself, I've been talking with the officials and uh, scholars in the area or working in different parts of this new system. I still have the feeling like we are not so clear about the, uh, the supportive kind of uh, aspects for this to reach these objectives. And also the role of science in the designation operation of the previous or the current systems. So, and you first monitoring all the issues I mentioned earlier and standards of scientific and manual assessment. And can we resolve that like something like overnight or we have some, you know, something new. So I think from, from the current situation, because we are still, still in the process, this is kind of ongoing uh, effort. So we are still not so clear about those issues, but we, we want to find out how China really, you know, like achieve its um, determination at uh, national level and also um, act as a responsible uh, state at international level. So I think for, 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 for China, probably we, there is one way probably easier is to look at the uh, international best practice and China is also participating as a BBNJ negotiation. I think we know that the tax has something there to be already um, quite clear for, for the government probably to look at the criteria, procedure, consultation, implementation, enforcement, all those, including monitoring review. And that probably make the, the, the work easier and also the technical capacity building efforts and to look at the scientific policy, legal, economic, all those 
sectors to work together and to have the specialist to help really put all the effort into this uh, systematic adjustment and really to reach our goal. I think probably that's the, for me, I would recommend that that way and really to, as I think China is such a huge country, whatever China does wrong, the whole world just can't be right. We want to avoid China become the weakest link in the marine conservation <laughs> effort. So I think with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks so much, Julia. The yeah, China doesn't want to be the weakest link. And we'll have more time in the Q&A. So uh, Dr. Leo Nanye, so you are, you are PowerPoint free. You're going to talk. So Julie, if you could uh, um, take down your PowerPoint, yeah, cool. that would be awesome. And then we could see. So Nanye, give us a smile and tell us your stories. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for having me, Jennifer and Nikki. Uh, uh, could everyone hear me? As Could everyone hear me and see me uh, yes. smiling? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you and just yeah, keep it to seven minutes, okay? Or less if you can. It looks like it's, I saw this. I saw it. Yeah. I, yes. Um, yes. Um, it's really a great pleasure to broadcast myself, to broadcast myself and share my view on China's role in the Southern Ocean. Uh, from a, a southern hemisphere, Sydney, winter, midnight. And I think I don't need to remind everyone in this panel, also our audience around the world, that we are now living in a disordered world. It's globally disordered. I think this COVID has changed, or some may say has accelerated the change uh, of uh, our world. So when we, are when we are talking about that we are now living in a uh, more disordered world, then where do we come from? I think we come from a existing rules-based order that we hear all the time from uh, uh, Western leaders. So if we are thinking about, if we are talking about China's role in the, uh, in the Southern Ocean, I think we should take this into account from an international scholar's perspective. That we are actually talking about a, a rising power in a existing rules-based order, an Antarctic treaty system that governs the Southern Ocean is actually part of an existing rules-based order uh, fabricated uh, uh, based on an American initiative post the Second World War. So what's, what, what's happening now in the Kamala? And Nikki and Julian have been talking about the dilemmas and also China's participation in the MPA negotiations. And what I see, which is quite interesting, is you see, before 2000, 2017, uh, China has been opposing uh, Rossi MPA, Rossi Region MPAs. And after 2017, China now has been proposing to establish uh, research monitoring, research and monitoring plans uh, as a kind of a threshold uh, criteria to set up MPAs. And so this is a very interesting what we we can uh, we can uh, call from uh, international relations that it's kind of a norm dynamics happening in Kamala that before 2017 China uh, traditionally as a norm entrepreneur and that's what China has always been doing and people used to because what we also used to in an old world, in, a, in an old world, is that we have norm entrepreneurs. Normally, they are good uh, Western liberal powers trying to promote good norms, uh, environmental protection, human rights, and uh, all sorts of good rules as norm entrepreneurs. And then countries like China and sometimes Russia and also other developing countries, they are normally kind of opposing at some point. But what is very interesting now is it is perfectly legal within Kamala because Kamala is, uh, the decision-making process of Kamala is consensus-based. And after this now we using its own rules. 
And its own rules is to set up a monitoring plan and also to, to kind of materialize uh, the, the, legal, the legal basis of uh, establishing Southern Ocean MPAs. Uh, but when we see both entrepreneur, when we see both China, China act, uh, act as both a norm entrepreneur and entrepreneur, uh, that is the new reality that we are now facing in a kind of a globally disordered world. That's the rising power in an existing rules-based power, rule-based order. And where are we heading to? What I see in Kamala is no matter China acts as an entrepreneur or entrepreneur, the core interest of China is the same. That is to promote rational use. And so, or as Julia mentioned, the official position is to balance uh, the, the balance between the use and the protection. And where does, what exactly does this rational use mean? Uh, the Chinese delegation has not deliberately explained what does that mean. But I think based on the, uh, based on the China's uh, the fishing and also Chinese practice in Kamala, we can we can actually kind of draw some uh, conclusions that that rational use uh, kind of means, you know, in Kamala, there is this precautionary cash limit uh, for krill fishery. And so far, every year, every year in Kamala's history, because fishing, uh, fishing uh, cash limits is set as a precautionary level, and no, it has never been reached. So there is a gap. There is a gap between Kamala's precautionary catch limit and the, the real catch uh, that has been done by con countries in the Southern Ocean every year. So there is a gap. And this really fits into China's national policy to expand its distant water fishing uh, very well. So that is the rational use that China is talking about. Uh, and so, that's, that's the, I think that's the root why there is a or, or kind of a difficulty uh, in establishing more and, uh, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying that uh, China a, is not going to, um, to support me, no, because China has supported the uh, NPA. Yeah. Nang Ye, your, video, your sound keeps going out. Maybe if you turned off your video that we get better quality sound because I, I keep losing your sound. And if you could just take like another minute and a half, that would be great. Yeah, that's a, oh, I think. Oh, that's much better. I think internet is a bit. Yeah, I think my internet is a bit. And, uh, uh, the first word internet, I must say. <laughs> and anyway, so I'm going to conclude. I, I, I'm going to conclude a, what, what I see that China's uh, participation in Kamala and more broadly within the Antarctic Treaty system is uh, if we kind of agree before that in the existing rules based order, the, in the environmental protection is the three pillars of the Antarctic Treaty System. So science, peace, and environmental protection. Now, what China has been proposing and pushing is to uh, push the sustainable development or sustainable use as another pillar of the, uh, of the Antarctic Treaty System. And this uh, kind of, there, this kind of showcases some, some difficulties in reality when we are, uh, how difficult it is to try then when uh, international organizations are trying to apply the precautionary uh, principle. I will just stop here. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so, um, yeah, so just, I like seeing your smiley face, but maybe we need to take off the video right now. Um, I guess you're, you're, yeah. you're your, your Wi-Fi is used to going to sleep at this time. So yeah, so I've got a few questions have come in from, from through our email. I'll toss some of those out and put some of mine in as well. And Nikki, be ready to jump in when you like. Um, one question we got from James N. Barnes, who's the board chair for the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. I'm guessing some of you must know James. Um, he asks, given the large Chinese science and logistics capacity in the Antarctic, how can Chinese delegates to Kamlar and the ministries be convinced to focus more on scientific research that supports conservation and species protection. And kind of related to that, there was a, 
uh, another question from Rasha Ardi, a reporter from Science Magazine, was kind of asking about what kind of negotiations can we expect and if the Chinese researchers are involved in the design and planning. So it's a, so it's a question of the role of the scientists. Um, Julian, do you want to start? And make sure you take yeah, off your... Yeah, good. I'm really happy to take a question from Jane Barnes. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I think uh, China has already uh, invested in uh, the science that could uh, support the designation of uh, MPAs uh, in the last the the last uh, the the expedition to so Antarctic expedition before the last one they 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 were tasked in such selection for uh, for us MPA at the Amundsen Sea. I, I think it was not successful, but it was on the news. They were tasked tasked it in a mission to uh, select the site do some research in the Amazon Sea for the MPAs. And uh, uh, in the last camera, China also submitted a, a, a paper on the uh, East Antarctica, and they said they, uh, they are with more capacity with the new icebreaker, they want to contribute to the science that support uh, MPA development in the East Antarctica. And I was kind of curious because I saw this, this, you know, building out, you know, um, of the science stations by the Chinese. Now, I know that other nations are also building science stations. I mean, do these, do these I mean, there's not much going on in Antarctica. I mean, do these scientists come together? Are, are Chinese scientists, for example, working with U.S. and European scientists on some of these projects? Or is everyone in their own little circle? Um, I, I don't know who would like to answer that question. I don't know if Julia or Nang Ye or Julian. Do you know about the, the types of science projects that, that the Chinese scientists are doing, maybe in cooperation with others? Uh, maybe I, I pick the, I respond to that. I, uh, the China's uh, science in Antarctica used to be mainly, mainly focused on uh, geologies and uh, astrophysics. You know, because the, the like the Kunlun station is on the highest point, which gives them the best place to observe the space, and the the mar marine research was uh, not not the, because the the, the icebreaker serves also as a cargo ship. They could not do much uh, research voyages, so the marine research was the weakest uh, one of the weakest part. But with uh, a new icebreaker, that capacity increases, and I. And the new station at Ross Sea will also be uh, uh, doing more marine research. Okay, another question that we, we got in here from Anita Parlo from Anita Parlo and Associates. Uh, she says, mention, mention of no fishing in the central Arctic Ocean and plans to fish in Antarctica. So that was noted in, I think your opening comments are Julian. What is the view from Beijing of the Central Arctic Ocean and fishing? So we kind of went to the other ocean, but um, does anyone have some insights on that, just briefly? Yeah, I think I can take that. Sure, uh, thanks, Nongye. Yeah, I think my internet is getting better. Okay. Um, there are, I think uh, China's position uh, regarding uh, fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean and uh, Southern, Southern Ocean, uh, is, uh, there is no difference between the two uh, oceans as far as I can tell, because uh, if, uh, essentially uh, the core position is the same, that is uh, to promote rational use. And uh, so what's going on uh, with the Central Arctic Ocean uh, is uh, there has been a uh, agreement uh, that was adopted in 2018 and supported by China to temporarily ban commercial fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean for 16 years. And uh, that, that is a very uh, reasonable uh, kind of compromise because uh, so far uh, there, uh, no commercial fishing uh, has occurred in the Central Arctic Ocean due to the ice. So Central Arctic Ocean is still ice covered, and it is predicted that that it will, might become uh, the ice might be retreat, might retreat very soon, and then commercial fisheries might start in the future. But so far there is no commercial fishing there, so it's it's kind of a uh, relatively easy. But in in 
but then when uh, in, during the negotiation process, uh, the European Union and Japan um, proposed the, what is called a stepwise approach. Uh, so first establish a temporary ban, and then the next step is to IFMO or original fisheries management organization or arrangement or a, a completely uh, a ban or complete ban of fishing as an MPA. So that's what's going on in the Arctic. So it's kind of the same. As li this is supported by China, the stepwise approach, as far as I can understand. Okay, Nikki, you have a question? Sure, and I did just want to add one more point to Rasha's question regarding when the next Kamlar meeting is. So currently Kamlar is planning a virtual meeting for the end of October, October and early November this year. And um, the exact details of that are still under negotiation, but we understand that MPAs are likely to be on the agenda for negotiation during that meeting. So the question... I wanted to ask was how does designation of Antarctic marine protected areas and other high seas marine protected areas um, align and complement with the protected area networks in China and China's other national interests? So that would probably be for briefly from Julia and Bean Bean because you both talked about some of the challenges that the, the great proliferation of protected areas in China, but they are not aren't going that well. Okay, Bing Bing, do you want to say something first? Yeah, so as far as I can um, know, I think they are pretty s separated processes. And the Department on Science engaged with these two designations are totally different. Hmm. And for example, the international waters actually, as far as I know, um, not many scientists are concerning these areas. And especially considering um, just the recent development of international MPAs in these open waters, just happening in recent years, and China began to realize like they actually like their own science in deciding whether it is legitimate or not. But actually, a lot of the signs are coming from other countries. So although China are trying to push this part forward, however, compared to domestic, although even for domestic, of marine conservation research still like behind the terrestrial ecosystem research. And as uh, Julia has mentioned, and for domestic destinations and marine and terrestrial are totally different. And there are certain research institutes and or organizations that are involved in helping with the destinations. So it's interesting to see who are in the circle are helping the government deciding where to put protected areas and who are outside and trying to engage with this process. And so um, it's an interesting thing, but as far as like whether China are considering connecting the domestic MPAs with the international MPAs, uh, I don't think it's right now in the agenda. Okay, even on Zoom, I have a two-finger question that my friend uh, Changhua Wu, she's the founding CEO of Teconet, um, she asked a question like, well, what about, you know, because clearly these two aren't, the domestic and international um, marine MPAs are not coordinated in terms of science, but she asked how are advances in technologies today that, you know, that like, that could help overcome some of the hurdles in terms of the monitoring, like um, satellite technology, digital tech, climate sciences, because there's a lot of tools out there. Um, I mean, could those be something that could be really helpful to, to make, you know, the, the, the monitoring and enforcement better and, you know, and, and China's um, participation in them? Can I jump uh, in here? Yeah, sure. So um, I think, you know, as we know, China is really interested in krill fishing and the distribution of krill in the Southern Ocean. And there's a lot of technologies that are developing to get better data about krill in the Southern Ocean. So the U.S. science for Kamlar used to run a survey in Antarctica and they decided that was no they decided that was no longer economically uh, the best option and now they've gone to a system of gliders where they're putting gliders in the water to actually monitor the krill distribution as well as other environmental variables that are really important and there's similar technologies coming out of Norway they've developed a sail buoy so it's a small little autonomous boat that can go down and uh, monitor the similar kind of information 
information. And, and there's also moorings that are going in, for example, to, that are put in, in stagnant places. So those are some of the examples of exciting technology. And there's um, also some really exciting satellite technology that's coming online um, for ecological studies. Uh, Pew's actually working with a researcher on a project we like to call Seals from Space with Dr. <laughs> Michelle LaRue, where uh, she is actually counting the distribution of seals in the Ross Sea using satellite data. And there's lots of other researchers like Heather Lynch that are doing similar work with penguins. So it's definitely um, an opportunity, particularly given the pro prohibitive cost of Southern Ocean science to yeah. move forward with some of these exciting new technologies to get the needed data for management. But that made me want to insert, like, who, who is it country by country paying for these? Because Camler is just a kind of a convening organization. Doesn't, do they have a big budget, Nicole? No, each country does conduct the science on their own. Okay. Or collaboratively, but it is up to the countries to fund that research. We're just about hitting to, to, to an end here, but I want to make sure that, Julia, did you have a quick comment? Because you talked extensively about some of the challenges within China on the MPAs. Do you have, because you, you know, could you tell us something a little bit about what you're seeing that what might happen maybe in the 14th five-year plan where will China's stance on, on working on the international MPAs, will it, will it change? Uh, yes, I actually get back to the previous question. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with Bin Bin Li about what he said, the two systems are quite different. And I would just like to add one point, like China has the largest fisheries population or fishing population. And China struggled really, really hard, I think, in the last 20 years, trying to, 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 to shift those fish, uh, or to reduce the fishing population, or to shift the fishermen to other industries. So with that, I think you can think about the approach for China to go to international area, like uh, the crew fishing or other distant water fishing. And China would like to have more fishing opportunities, I mean, legally, to get more fishing permits to feed its fishing population. So that's with that. And it can't really go too fast, I mean, at the international front, because that's but, one way, two, uh, one of the two uh, outway for China to uh, reduce or to reduce the fishing pressure in these uh, domestic uh, waters. But, but I do have to interject that China does subsidize their fishing fleets. Their distant fishing uh, fleets are getting government sure, support. Yes, but now cutting down quite a lot. And another okay. thing is quite substantial. Uh, impact is about the Yanchu River. You know the Yanchu River, we have a total fishing ban along the river. That really affects so many provinces. So the government, the, the central government, local government are busy in dealing with those, you know, so many issues. I think that really make it very hard for China to, to try to balance both uh, fields, I think, with that. And also about scientific uh, support, uh, not only for the um, uh, international Southern Ocean. I, with our field trip, we have found some of the um, provinces, they, they have very good scientific support in the monitoring or the assessment of uh, biomass and things like that. But some provinces, they are comparatively quite weak. And I think one, uh, one MPA, they, 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 they said they haven't seen the, the protected species, the target species since 1970s. So we're just thinking, I think they, they suffer very badly from the baseline data. They don't really have the, you know, I think that's probably quite common for the domestic management of MPAs. Yeah. I, just well, that. I know that we're, we're hitting up to our, our deadline time, but I wanted to make sure just if maybe if, if Julia and, and Nung Ye and Nikki, if you had any final comments you wanted to, to, to jump in. I mean, I, I mean, the, my crystal ball question is like, is China going to sign, is going to support these three MPAs? I mean, what are you seeing, Julian? Do you think? Uh, or you can make I, any other final comment you like. No, no, I, I am still uh, optimistic on uh, uh, China's participation in this process. Uh, it takes time, takes some time to uh, learn because China does not have uh, have not made, uh, designated any MPA as large as this, and they see it as a completely different uh, approach. And it, it, it takes time for them to for China to uh, learn 
and uh, to, and also to get the uh, domestic politics uh, organized, mm -hmm. like the particularly the science and the po uh, policy. The bridge connects those two. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm still optimistic. Okay, um, Nikki, do you wanna you wanna close us out here as my co-sponsor or and Nungye? Go ahead, Nikki, you start. Sure. So, I mean, I'm eternally optimistic. So I think it is possible that China will agree to these three marine protected areas. It's even possible in 2020. Um, I think, you know, China's a very deliberate, mixed uh, deliberate decision making. But I think the key is open and honest communication between, um, you know, anybody that any country that might have issues with the MPAs and the MPA proponents. So having those dialogues in advance of the Kamlar meeting is key, uh, given particularly this year that it will be taking place on Zoom versus in Hobart, Tasmania, where it normally happens and you get to have these sort of side negotiations in the hallways and over tea. So I think that it is possible if, if those, you know, if all parties are willing to have open and honest communication. And I think it's not only possible, but necessary um, in 20. 20, we, you know, we see the COVID crisis and what happens when we're not careful about our relationship with the environment. And I think we're all entering a new normal. And this is a great opportunity for a positive punch at the end of um, what has otherwise been a very challenging year. Now, I, th I think we'll wrap it up with that because it was such an optimistic uh, comment here at the end. But I've also seen with the, a whole bunch of questions just came in, but we're definitely going to, with hopefully working with Pew, we're going to keep having some of these sessions with uh, Maybe just get a smaller number of people, so longer Q and A, because I love the Q and A. Um, I want to thank all the speakers and everyone who joined in. We hit about three hundred people. Wow, this is that doesn't fit in my auditorium at the Wilson Center. So there, there are some positive sides of Zoom. But I want to thank you all, and I, I think that um, Bean Bean, you mentioned Louis Pugh. We're hopefully going to have him come and talk um, sometime in the fall. So we're doing kind of hopefully more of a TED talk. He's quite an amazing speaker. And there, of course, will be videos of him jumping into icy waters. So um, again, I want to thank uh, Pew and all of my colleagues at the Wilson Center and all the speakers. Um, thank you very much and have a great end of summer day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.